Good. <clears throat> so, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the IDP Expedition 406 information webinar. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, connecting with us today to learn more about our expedition to core on the New England shelf. So, my name is David McEnroy. I'm your webinar host, as well as the science manager for the eCord Science Operator, or ESO. Uh, and we are the group that will be responsible for implementing this expedition under the auspices of the International Ocean Discovery Programme, or IODP. Now, uh, joining me for this webinar today are the expedition co-chief scientist, Professor Brandon Dugan from the Colorado School of Mines and Professor Karen Johansson from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, and we also have the expedition project manager, Jez Everest from the eCard Science Operator also joining us. So we're very pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you about the scientific and technical aspects of this expedition. Uh, and hopefully we can persuade you all to apply to join the science party at some point. Now, before we start, I'd just like to point out that this webinar is being recorded and uh, we may include a record of any questions and answers and chat conversations that uh, occur and we'll, we will eventually make these public. So just so you know. Okay, Jez, can you hit the next slide, please? So in a few moments, I'll ask Brandon and Karen to take over uh, and introduce themselves and explain the scientific objectives behind this expedition. Uh, after they have finished, Jez will explain how this expedition will be implemented. Um, some of you no doubt have had IODP experience before on either the Joides resolution or perhaps the CHICU, uh, but I'm also sure that many of you have never participated in IODP before and to you, you're especially welcome. So this expedition is what is called an IODP mission specific platform expedition. Uh, and Jez will talk about what that means shortly because there are some significant differences between this type of operation and other IODP expeditions that uh, everyone should be aware of. After that, um, I will then cover the application process and some of the steps that will take place after you apply. And then all going to plan, we should have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end. And we'll try not to go over the hour, um, but we can do so if we have a lot of questions to answer. Um, of course, it's fine for anyone to leave the webinar at any point. You won't interrupt proceedings at all. OK, Jez, another click. <clears throat> now, during the webinar, please um, register any questions you might have using the Q&A window that you can see at the bottom of the screen. So please try not to use the chat function. We want to use the Q&A function. It's just a lot easier for the panel if we can view one window for questions and not two. So please, Q&A window only for questions. And what we'll do is we'll save all questions until the end and then we'll try and answer as many as we can. Okay, that's it for the introduction. We'll now bring Brandon and Karen's presentation online and we'll start the co-chief science presentation. So I'll just hand over to you, Brandon, to share and you can introduce yourselves. That looks good. All right, uh, thank, you. thank you, Dave. Can everybody hear me all right? All right, um, so uh, thanks for that introduction, Dave. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Brandon Dugan. I'm at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, this is a really exciting um, expedition for me. I've worked on a range of marine geology and geophysical problems over my career. Um, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been really focused on how do we get offshore fresh and groundwater, and I'm excited to be part of this this project, um, I'll let Karen give a brief introduction of herself, and then we'll talk a little bit about my viewpoint and our viewpoint on the project um, to get you engaged and answer some questions for you. Go ahead, Karen. I think you're muted, Karen. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> I think I'd learn how to do this by now after all these pandemic semesters. Um, I'm Karen Johannesson. I'm a geochemist, low temperature geochemist mainly. Um, and I'm currently at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. I used to be at Tulane for a hundred years, seemed like. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm involved in this because of my interest in rare earth elements in uh, submarine groundwater discharge, uh, among other things. So Anna has put together a very comprehensive talk. I guess I will mention a few things towards the end. Um, but I'm I'm new to this uh, as well, so I'm I'm learning as I go along. Thank you, Karen. 
great to have you on board. And, and for the audience out there, I think it's great to have people who are um, new to the community joining in these exciting problems. Um, so for my 20 minutes, and I'll try to keep us on time, I'm gonna I give a brief overview. Um, and I, I just wanted to start with this title, title page, um, which really gives a history of this project and, and all the people who are involved, Karen and I as co-chiefs, um, but this whole list of other people have been involved, um, academics, uh, USGS colleagues, many people over the last 20 years, um, and many discussions with other people um, about offshore fresh and groundwater, submarine groundwater discharge, and, and what we know about this. Um, and these two pictures, the one on the left here is sampling um, from the Joides drill site offshore Florida from the early 1980s. And this was sort of the way we discovered offshore fresh and groundwater was this uh, primitive at time, but opportunistic sampling where people realized it may not be seawater and they were collecting samples and trying to understand how much seawater was there versus how much fresh water in the offshore environment. And sort of this was the state of the art. And I think at some level, most of what we know have been these opportunistic or, or chance opportunities of um, collecting offshore fresh and groundwater. On the right, we have a completely other side of that where we, the community have brought together solute transport, groundwater models that look at sea level rise, glacial inundation, sedimentation. Um, and in this, we're just showing freshwater in blue, salt water in red. And this is some work from Denis Cohen and others in 2010, um, showing what the distribution of offshore fresh and groundwater might look like from a hydrodynamic model, showing transients through time, um, and also slight well locations showing what the, the freshwater is. And, and to me, this is really the origin of Expedition um, 406 or offshore fresh and groundwater um, as a whole. We have some anecdotal sampling, but not really rigorous testing that was done for hydrogeology. We have the ability to do great modeling. And now we need the data that allows us to collect those. So I'm gonna talk, walk through the objectives of the expedition, then talk a little bit about the history of the New England Shelf Hydrogeology Project, and then dive in a little bit more on the specifics of Expedition 406. All right, so what are the objectives here? Um, and there are nine of them, so I've just broken them up into to slides, um, different slides, so there's not too many words on each slide. But the first one is, is, is sort of the all-encompassing um, goal. What is the distribution of fresh water? What are the pressures in this system? And what are the temp temperatures across the New England continental shelf? More broadly, how could we apply this to other environments? But it's taking that anecdotal data and actually analyzing it in a hydrogeological framework rather than just opportunities. And then we can start addressing the rest of these objectives. How old is this water? When was it in place? What is its residence time? Um, was this freshwater recharged due to glaciation, um, ice sheet basal melting, infiltration through proglacial lakes, um, direct recharge from precipitation during sea level low stands? These are all potential mechanisms. Which ones are important in this environment? And what would the driving forces be in different environments? Um, does the hydro hydrogeologic state the pressures, the chemistry, how well does it reflect modern sea level conditions? How far out of equilibrium are we? Um, and, and how is that driving flow or transport of solutes all the way um, beneath the shelf and in submarine groundwater discharge? Then we can start to look at some of the more um, chemical and microbiological aspects of things. So what's happening within the fluids and sediments? Um, what are the concentrations, production, consumption? and controls of methane, nutrients, and rare earth elements in these shelf sediments? And how are they moving around? How are they cycling? At what time ske schedules? Um, and how does that respond to changes in sea level or other driving forces? Um, then we can start to look at the organic matter. What are the redox processes um, happening? What are the microbial communities involved? What is the carbon that they're using? Where are they getting that carbon from? Um, and what is the distribution of these microbial um, communities and continental shelves? Um, this is an, a dynamic environment where the chemistry um, and fluid pressures might be changing over geologic timescales, but also over um, sea level timescales. Um, and how does that affect the communities and what they're doing? Um, and then we can, we can look more at the discharge aspects of things. What are the magnitude of long-term fluxes of methane and nutrients from the shelf? Um, dur during low stands when the shelf might be flushed? 
Um, this also just relates to submarine groundwater discharge in general. How much fluid is coming out? And what is the concentration of that fluid? Um, how, how does this emplacement, specifically for the New England shelf with ice sheet meltwaters likely being um, a component, how does that create a unique environment for methane production? Um, how does that evolve over time? Um, and then we can step back to a lot of IODP work of, you know, what is sea level history over time and how is it related or recorded in different margins? Um, and this opportunity, for Expedition 406 gives us an opportunity to look at how sea level is recorded in the stratigraphy along a glaciated margin, but also how does this relate to the mechanics, permeability evolution, the flow evolution, and the geomicrobiology and biogeochemical cycling. Um, as I mentioned, we're focused on the New England shelf, but this is just a compilation put together by Vincent Post and colleagues in 2013, showing that there could be significant volumes of offshore freshwater stored around the world. Each one of these dots is a different um, documentation or evidence or interpretation of offshore, offshore fresh and groundwater. So here, Expedition 406 will focus here in Nantucket. But we could look at Florida, we can look at off South America, we can look at the South, uh, South Africa where there was a water shortage in 2018 where offshore fresh uh, groundwater might have been a vital um, contributor to resolving that, all the way over to East China Sea and Japan. This is a worldwide phenomenon and there might be as much as 500,000 cubic kilometers of freshwater stored, but we've never really done a rigorous investigative study to try and understand this hydrogeologic system recharge mechanisms, timing, and that's what Expedition 406 really provides us. All right, so diving in a little more local, so to just orient people, here's New York, Long Island, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and the Continental Shelf um, south of them. And there were these old Joides wells drilled by the US Geological Survey as part of the AMCOR project in the 1970s. And these are really what opened the community's eyes to offshore fresh and groundwater. So the 6001 well, the first one I've got shown here in depth below seafloor is located on Nantucket Island. And we see that in salinity from zero up to seawater salinity, the shallow unconfined aquifer starts out as fresh water as you'd expect from media New York infiltration. Then we go down, and we see goes to more seawater conditions. And then it comes back and there are these sort of anomalous, deeper, non-equilibrium freshwater systems. And that was pretty exciting, but we can look at 6011 located here in almost 60 meters of water depth offshore. And a similar thing was observed where we go through the upper sedimentary section and we see near seawater conditions. And then we got down deeper and we saw basically fresh water down there, and then it started getting saltier again. So this was sort of what made people raise the question, how is this fresh water getting offshore? How is it stabilizing or remaining there over time? And then we can look at transition zones, 6009, moving farther offshore, where we see not totally fresh water, but freshened water. And the questions are, how is this related to the stratigraphy, geological evolution? And that's part of what we're trying to address. Early researchers from that that work, this is from Hathaway et al. in the original drilling in 1979, put together a cross section moving from onshore New Jersey, offshore New Jersey. So this is significant vertical exaggeration. We're looking at a couple hundred kilometers across, seawater's in purple, and we're looking at about a kilometer of sediments here. And just by using the, the onshore information, outcrops, well data, and the offshore interpretation, we put together a geological cross section that showed this big tongue of freshwater extending maybe 100 kilometers offshore based on a handful of well locations. And so there was this really exciting discovery in the late 1970s and thought more about in the 1980s that there might be significant volumes of freshwater stored offshore. How much, where is it, is part of what we're trying to address today still. All right, I want to just add another aspect to this. So this is... Um, I'm going to start up here in the upper right. What are how active are these fluid flow systems? So as we've started to think about offshore fresh and groundwater, we've also started to think about shallow and confined aquifers and submarine groundwater discharge, but also deeper confined 
aquifers and submarine groundwater discharge. And it's important to understand for the, the biogeochemistry and basic shelf ocean interactions, what is the chemistry of that submarine groundwater discharge? What is its duration? What is its volume? And what's driving it? And so this map is a little bit rotated, but here's Massachusetts up here. And this inset map is rotated. So just going up here, here's Nantucket. Martha's Vineyard, so sort of our study area, but going all the way down to North Carolina. And this is some work from Adam Starkey and colleagues in 2014. And this is just documentation along the shelf slope break of significant volumes, regular occurrence, submarine groundwater discharge happening. This is a passive margin, but is hydrogeologically very active. There's discharge of fluids coming out there. And how is the discharge or is the discharge of these fluids chemically or hydrologically related to what's happening beneath the shelf, one of the driving mechanisms. So we could return to this 6001 well on Nantucket. And this is just showing the head on this as a function of time. And this deep 6001 well is showing the hydraulic head in a deep aquifer, a test stratigraphic well that was drilled in the 70s. And it's basically showing that the pressures are in non-equilibrium. So there are excess pressures that could be driving flow in this local environment potentially to these shelf seeps, and is it linked to these offshore seeps as well? And so this is sort of the broad scale thing, how much fresh water is out there, where is it moving, how fast is it moving, and where is it being discharged? So models, conceptual models have been put together for this region. And so we can look at the continental shelf freshwater system, sort of the equilibrium state shown here. So if you look at equilibrium of current Sea level, shoreline is located over here. We might have some islands like Long Island or Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. We've got the ocean over here. And we have aquifers and confining units and bedrock. So it's a passive margin stratigraphic sequence. And if everything's in equilibrium with modern sea level, we can use the Ivan Herzberg principle and sort of predict where the saltwater freshwater interface should be, where we have meteoric water recharging the shallow aquifers, and then we move down into saltier water beneath. Well, the data from the 70s and 80s shows that we have fresh water farther offshore and deeper than we should. So different models have been put forward for what might be driving that. So we can look at during sea level low stands where we've taken sea level, lowered it, lowered it down significantly. Now we have rainfall and infiltration across large swaths of the continental slope or shelf. And we have high elevation driving fluid deeper down into the aquifer. Um, confining unit connectivity and continuity is a really important here to think about the distributions. And then another model um, is looking at now we have a high latitude where the ice sheet has migrated out onto the shelf, starts deforming the shelf. And we have basal meltwater and we have proglacial lakes out in front of these high head that can drive fresh water out significant volumes. These will have different geochemical signatures. They'll have different pressure signatures. Um, and so we're building off this work of Grown and Person and colleagues um, from the early 2000s of what are the driving forces of these systems and how do they work? And Expedition 406 is a great way to test this. So sort of ask myself this question routinely is, is why New England? And I get this uh, quite regularly. Um, New England has a lot of, of fresh water. It's, it's green and lush. Why aren't we looking somewhere else? Um, and I think the answer is multifold. Um, starting with, we have a lot of starting data there. So we can, we can make educated, informed um, hypotheses and go out and test them directly and apply it in other directions. It also has a lot of the ingredients that, are, um, that I posed in that conceptual model from others. And so we can start out by looking at the glacial history. This is a glaciated margin. So this is just some work um, from Uchupi et al. in 2001 and, and Siegel et al. 2012, looking at the glacial history of this margin. So just to orient you, here's Massachusetts again, Rhode Island. And at the late, last glacial ma maximum, it was interpreted that the ice sheet, ice sheet extended just beyond the islands a little bit down here and then out. So we have this big ice sheet sitting out there that could have been providing subglacial meltwater um, proglacial lakes to recharge the aquifer system. And if we step back in time, it's been interpreted that during marine isotope, isotope stage 12, 
the glacier extended potentially out near the shelf slope break, which would give us a huge ice sheet extending down beneath in the area that we will actually study with Expedition 406. So it gives us a test on the glacial interpretation of this margin. How did that relate to the stratigraphy? But how also does it relate to the water? So now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper to the study area here, which is just south of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. So again, to orient you, here's Martha's Vineyard, here's Nantucket, it was 40 kilometers for scale. In 2009, we went out and collected an NSF-sponsored site survey, a bunch of geophysical data, seismic data to interpret the stratigraphy along this margin and identify potential drilling targets. So just to show you what the seismic data looked like, going from northwest to southeast along this margin, so northwest the southeast, about 100 kilometers of seismic data here, and a depth down to about 800 meters that are, that's interpreted. We can see the oceanic basement right here, and then we can start to see young, uh, older Oligocene um, and Cretaceous, Cretaceous to Oligocene sediments coming up here with a relatively consistent stratigraphy. Then we see some clinoform development. We see some erosional unconformities here, likely related to glaciation, more uh, prograding clinoforms and onlap in the shelf sequence, and then a very shallow Pleistocene section. That's the interpretation. We don't have a lot of data to constrain this, but that's how we've interpreted it. And then we picked different drill sites moving from 8A to 5B, and we'll talk a little bit about why those different sites um, may or may not be advantageous to this project. And that's where the next, probably the, the biggest um, input to this drilling program is, has come forward. We originally had these sites, interpretations based on models where the freshwater might be. And then Gustafson and colleagues um, in 2019 published this paper. So overlaying on the seismic, we have the resistivity um, going from the log base 10 and ohm meters from negative one, but you can think about this as salt water in blue to higher resistivity or fresher water in red. And what Gustafson and colleagues interpreted was this big resistive tongue extending 40-ish kilometers or 50 -ish kilometers offshore, and then transitioning into this lower resistive environment. And it's a very simple interpretation of this is fresh water making the sedimentary sequence more resistive and seawater making the system less resistive. So now we have potential drill sites that have stratigraphic interpretation. And I think one of the more exciting things that came out of this paper was the top of this freshwater lens correlates very, very well with this erosional unconformity, which perhaps shows up better in this yellow line on the previous slide. And so that freshwater does seem to have a stratigraphic um, tie. And so how is the stratigraphy um, working with the flow and how does it work? And so the idea would be to drill site in the freshwater zone, a site in the transition zone, and a site in the seawater zone to understand the interaction of these things and, and the play between them. Um, we've done a lot of modeling on this. So we have quantitative predictions. So Stiegel and colleagues looked at the role of permeability. So these are just different permeability architectures where red is high permeability, blue is low permeability, I'm looking at different connectivity of the permeability. We can predict for different loading and sea level cycles, how much fresh water might be stored in the section. And for this permeability architecture, we see that there's this blue shows fresh water, um, fresh water that exists tens of kilometers offshore, a little bit inconsistent with the geophysical data. Um, and if we change the permeability architecture, we get a very different distribution, and in this case, a smaller distribution of fresh water. So one of the really important needs here is to understand how well that stratigraphy is connected, what is the permeability architecture of the aquifers, but also the aquitard, so we can improve our groundwater modeling and make more advanced predictions about where the fresh water is, how much fresh water there is, and how it's changed over time. Um, Mark Crisson has been pushing this um, even farther. Um, looking at how can we start to incorporate the geochemistry into it, not just um, salt water and fresh water. And so this is some modeling work that's hot off the press that he's been working on the last couple of weeks, where starting to make predictions about what the Delta O18 concentrations will be 
at different ice sheet systems and also what is the age of the groundwater. So here's looking at if the ice sheet only extended out as far as Martha's Vineyard, what is the oxygen isotope um, distribution? And what is the age of the water? So we can start thinking about residence times and availability and recharge. What if we have a different glacial system where the glacier extends all the way out to the shelf slope? So break, how does this change the oxygen isotopes and the age and residence time of the water? And for reference, what if there was no ice sheet involved at all? How does this system look? And so we have very, very good, strong predictions about what the hydrogeology looks like. But again, we still need to test those models and provide more constraints to how things work. I'm gonna hand it over to Karen here for a minute to talk a little bit about something that's been woefully undersampled and um, looked at, which is a rare earth element cycling and the geomicrobiology. Karen, you wanna talk for a couple minutes on this slide? I can try. Um, so yeah, so I think I just wanna, I guess I'll say that we're looking for innovative techniques um, uh, from scientists who wanna be on the expedition. Uh, that we can that can be used to probe some of these deep shelf fresh groundwater systems, um, and I uh, address the objectives that Brandon uh, started, uh, elucidated earlier, but also maybe open up new lines of inquiry. Inquiry, and one of the things I was well, not I was, but we've been thinking about is um, we don't really know much about them, as far as I know, and I could be wrong because I'm not a geomicrobiologist, but we don't seem to know much about what's you know what's going on in these systems in terms of the microbiology and how that affects the chemistry of the waters. And so uh, uh, Brandon was uh, was elucidating or talking about um, you know what 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 are the sources of organic matter that these organisms may be using? Where is it coming from? Um, so I guess initially it's like what's there, what are they doing? Are there uh, genomic techniques that we can use to probe these systems? And so um, that's what kind of I was looking the other day for some some just some papers on this, uh, you know, in these systems, and that was very, very sparse. Um, of course, I could talk about the rare earth forever, but I don't think I want to bore you all with that. But um, uh, we are also, I mean, I think there's a fair amount of interest in looking at uh, rare earths, and particularly the neodymium isotopes in these systems, to see what that can tell us. Um, and I know there's also interest from some colleagues uh, in boron isotopes uh, to look at these waters. So. Um, Again, we're looking for people who have ideas uh, for ways of uh, studying these systems while we're there uh, so that we can get as much information as possible. That's, that's, I mean, that's kind of random uh, blabbing, but um, I'll probably just let, leave it at that so I don't take up any time. Thanks, Karen. And, and I would just add what, you know, to reemphasize, um, we have a great opportunity to characterize this system more completely than it's ever been characterized before. And so we want creative, innovative ideas yeah, to collect all the samples that we think we might be able to use um, and, and take some of these, I would say, detailed but conceptual diagrams and put numbers and quantities on them. So you know, how do we really want to do this? And what are we permitted to do? And how much time um, or money do we have? So this is the same image that I showed you before with seismic and resistivity. Um, and the general, general plan is each site will have a single hole to a maximum depth of 550 meters below seafloor, and we'll drill a total of three sites. Um, the plan for this is to start here at site 8A, where we have the highest confidence that there's a big, thick freshwater zone. We can characterize the freshwater zone, the stratigraphy, um, the biogeochemistry, the geobiology above it and below it, what's happening there. Then the idea would be to move out over here. Oops to site 4C, where we see, we believe that there's a transition from the more freshened system to the more seawater system. And we'll be looking at the salinity as we collect the cores um, and make a decision here. If this is more of a seawater end member, then our third site would be to come back and do site 3C as the transitional site. If 4C is more of a transitional site, we could move farther offshore to get the seawater end member, what we think is reflective. Um, some previous models I should, I should point out indicate that there may have been freshwater here in the past related to submarine groundwater discharge. So this could be an environment where it was 
seawater, then it was freshened, and then it was seawater again. So there's exciting opportunities at all of these sites. Um, how are we going to do this? Uh, we'll do standard lab measurements and sampling. Um, I won't read all these words. The slides can be available to anybody who wants them. But just a high level, we'll do the lithostratigraphy, trying to understand what the sediments are, how they're connected. Um, biostratigraphy, to understand the age model, when things were, were changing. Fluid and sediment geochemistry are hugely important to this, this project. So we want to look at how the fluid geochemistry is changing with, with time, how things are cycling and moving around and at what time scales. Um, we've already talked about carbon a little bit. So what is the carbon there? What are the microbes that are using it? And that ties nicely into the microbiology, what are the communities, abundances, and distribution. And for those who know me, the physical properties of these sediments, you know, so what's controlling um, porosity and permeability, um, what's the strength of these sediments, how are they deforming, how are they evolving over time, and so those are what I, I would call the, the standard lab measurements. I think what's exciting about this project and what makes it a little bit more exciting is um, it's a difficult environment for wireline logging, but it's going to provide critical information to us, primarily in terms of what is the resistivity structure from well logging so we can calibrate it against those regional marine uh, electrical, uh, or those EM surveys and MT surveys that I showed you from Gustafson et al. Um, and potentially, you know, sort of to be determined based on funding and availability, maybe also doing nuclear magnetic resonance logging where we can get something more on core volumes independent of lithology, um, but also permeability with calibrated models. Really important to this is an, uh, an aspect of aquifer pumping tests. So this is going to allow us to really test what those aquifers are, which are hard to recover during traditional coring um, operations. We'll get aquifer pro properties, but also what I would call pristine or more pristine fluid samples um, that IODP has traditionally um, recovered from pore water squeezing, which we will also do. But these fluid samples will be integral to, to microbiology, so things that haven't been disturbed or have been less disturbed by drilling water, whole suite of different um, dating techniques to understand the timing and emplacement of waters, and then again to look at, at fluid cycling and rates. Um, and then there's also a proposal in the mill to do some long-term um, measurements where we'd have multiple levels at two sites of pressure, temperature, and resistivity. So we could look at sort of regional scale properties, do things like tidal loading um, and tie them to onshore wells and, and um, well data to see how well or poorly things may or may not be connected. And so I think this is uh, the last slide that I have. Um, so how can you be involved in this will lead into the next part of the presentation. There's uh, opportunities for offshore and onshore participation. Um, offshore will focus primarily on, on time sensitive measurements. Um, the in-situ measurements and sampling that need to be done, done and, and any specialty measurements that come up related to geobiology or biogeochemistry or hydrogeology. There's the onshore participation. Um, there's also just the opportunity to participate through sample requests. Um, and then ongoing science discussions. This is an open community and I'm, I want to be as open with everybody as I can about sharing what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and the data. So I'm just putting this out there and I'm happy to talk to anybody today, tomorrow. And I'll make a plug for AGU 2023, where there's a whole session um, on new developments in the exploration for and development of inland brackish water resources and continental shelf fresh and groundwater. So I think there's lots of opportunities for engagement, whether they be formal participation or just continued discussion um, to give us great ideas. And I think I went a little bit long. I apologize, but I think we can move on to the next part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brandon, and thank you, Karen, as well, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Um, now, I see some questions have come in already, but we're going to hold off on them just now until the very end, because we want to make sure we get all the information across. Um, so um, let's hand over now to Jez, who will go through the implementation part of the presentation from ESO. Jez, over to you, please. Thanks, Dave. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jez Everest. I'm going to be the expedition project manager on Expedition 406. And uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, good. Yep. Uh, so I'm just going to talk in very general terms for about 10 minutes. 
excuse me, about the operational side of the expedition. Uh, I will start off, let me just change the slide, there we go. Right, I'll start off by uh, explaining just what an IUDP mission specific platform is. Uh, and then I'll touch on the outline of the expedition schedule. I'll talk about the platform itself and the drilling strategy that we're going to employ. And I will briefly go through some of the standard measurements that we take offshore and then introduce a key part of MSBs, which is the onshore science party. So let's kick off. Ooh, come on. Ooh. My computer is not behaving. Apologies for this. Come on. Ah. Uh, apologies for this, ladies and gents. My computer is being extraordinarily slow. Right, here we go. So for this expedition, we will not be using either of the two dedicated IODP vessels, which uh, the American Joides Resolution or the Japanese vessel, the Chiku, two vessels I'm sure some of you will be already familiar with. Uh, instead, what we use is what's called a mission-specific platform. And this is a vessel specially contracted to meet the unusual requirements of certain IODP expeditions. These can be things like working in very shallow seas or in ice covered waters, for example. And although MSPs and other IODP expeditions have several common elements, there are some key differences that you should be aware of. And let's hope that my slides change again. Oh, come on. Right, okay. So, first of all, for Expedition 406, uh, there'll be the normal number of scientists for an IODP expedition with around 30 scientists forming the, the science party. Uh, the expedition is made up of two parts. Uh, the first part is the offshore phase. Uh, and during this phase, uh, because accommodation and lab space is limited offshore, we don't split the cores at sea and we only focus on the essential and time sensitive tasks, which for this expedition are measurement of ephemeral properties, uh, those measurements required to guide the drilling to recover the best quality core that we can, uh, downhole logging, groundwater sampling, and time sensitive sampling. So for example, things like microbiology where uh, sample properties may degrade over time. Around seven to 12 scientists from the science party, science party will actually participate offshore. So it's less than half. And um, those scientists will be chosen based on the expertise that we actually need to carry out these tasks offshore. So following the offshore phase, uh, we hold the uh, onshore science party, which forms part two of the expedition. This is held at the IODP Bremen core repository in Germany. And this is where we split the course for the first time and we carry out the full suite of IODP uh, measurements, descriptions, and all the sampling that takes place there. The whole science party, including those people who participated offshore are expected to attend the OSP. And this is therefore equivalent to the main analysis phase that usually takes place offshore on the larger IODP vessels. The key point here is that both part one and part two comprise the full expedition, so the offshore and the onshore phase. So as uh, Brandon and Karen have already told us the expedition drill sites are located just offshore uh, Nantucket, New England, uh, northeast coast of the USA. And whichever drill sites are finally chosen, they're all relatively shallow waters. Um, they are all relatively near shore. And this potentially allows for regular resupply to the vessel. Currently, the offshore part of the expedition is scheduled for around 70 to 90 days within a window between June and August next year. So that's June and August 2024. 
if this planned period for the offshore phase holds, and we don't expect it will change, uh, then we expect to hold the onshore science party in Bremen, Germany, in either December 2024 or early in 2025. And the OSP never lasts any longer than 28 days. Come on. Right. Now, the, the drilling platform for 406 is as yet undecided, but we do have two main options. The first is a lift boat or a jack-up style vessel. Um, we've used these in the past in Mexico and offshore New Jersey in previous expeditions. Uh, lift boats have advantages in that they provide us a very stable drilling platform and they're ideally suited to expeditions with single or small numbers of drill sites. But they can obviously only drill in shallow, shallow waters as they operate standing on the seabed and they can only transit during calm sea conditions. So our second option is therefore a larger geotechnical vessel uh, such as this one, the Fugro Synergy, which we used for Expedition 381 in Greece. Uh, this style of vessel has the advantage of being able to quickly transit through deep waters in most weather conditions and will already be equipped with a dedicated drill. Um, we expect the coring tools will be deployed using the normal wireline coring method. Uh, this provides a mechanism to continually core sediment and rock and recover the cores to the deck in core barrels. These are then handled and curated by the ESO curators before being passed to the science party for various initial analyses. Uh, coring tools and bottom hole assemblies can be varied depending on the lithologies being drilled and the ESO drilling coordinators will work with the vessel provider and the science party to select the most appropriate coring tools. And we obviously carry a range of spares and uh, different bits to cope with expected and unexpected lithologies. Importantly, uh, this expedition requires the extraction and analysis of large amounts of groundwater, uh, with some initial analyses being carried out while still offshore. So we'll be liaising with the co-chiefs and the equipment manufacturers to determine the most efficient way of installing and operating any equipment required to carry out these analyses on whichever drilling platform we choose. Right, okay, so I want to give you a bit of a feel for the offshore environment and how we actually arrange MSP expeditions on unfamiliar vessels. So as an example, uh, this photo on the left was taken during our 2013 expedition in the Baltic. Uh, and it's taken from the rig looking down on the working deck and the drill floor, which, come on. Goodness me, my computer's slow. Dave, I need a new laptop. Uh, so this is the drill floor here, and this is a customized setup changing with every MSP, and it's the hallmark of MSP expeditions. So being a temporary setup, the working deck may not look quite as polished as it does on some other research vessels, but what it does offer is the flexibility to put whatever infrastructure we need on board to meet the expedition's objectives. The photo on the right here uh, is the core bench, which you can see on the deck view here. This is where the recovered cores are taken out of the core barrel and prepared by the ESO curators. The cores then make their way to this configuration of blue containers, and these are the ESO containerized laboratories where the initial scientific analyses are carried out. And the next picture I'll show you is where the fun stuff actually happens. So this is what is known as Main Street when my photos finally load. There we go. And these are taken from Expedition 381 in Greece in 2017. Basically what they show is two rows of ESO container labs facing onto a common walkway. Uh, and the containers are arranged so that they follow the natural core workflow. So the whole cores and their subsamples can be easily transferred backwards and forwards from station to station in a logical manner to complete all the analyses that are required. If we look into the containers, we can see the kind of working environment that scientists can expect should they become part of the offshore team. So first we have the core curation container, and this is the first port of call for new cores arriving on the deck. 
Then we have uh, the Petrophysics container, which contains the multi-center core logger or MSCL. We have a clean geochemistry lab for core water analyses and a core description and general science lab with samples, smear slides, uh, preparation facilities, microscopes, an area for sample description, as well as computer terminals. We also have a, a clean microbiology lab, which can be used if it's required. Uh, and if space is too tight for all of these labs, then the geochemistry lab can double up as a microbiology lab as well. So offshore measurements, I'm not gonna read all these out because there's loads, um, but this is a list of measurements that are typically acquired offshore on MSPs. Um, I explained earlier that the limited space and accommodation on an MSP platform means that we need to focus on high quality core recovery, some initial core description, uh, the capture of geochemical, microbiological and physical ephemeral property measurements. Um, we also have downhole logging is uh, a key offshore activity, and you can see here listed uh, a number of tools that can potentially be used for Expedition 406. Uh, the final logging program will be discussed and decided with the co-chiefs, and for this expedition, the logging service will be provided by the European Petrophysics Consortium, who are one of the ESO partners. This expedition is uh, kind of unique in that we'll also be undertaking exten extensive sampling offshore for groundwater. So this will involve numerous things, in, including screening of intervals that holds for pump testing and extraction, uh, as uh, Brandon's already described, sampling groundwater in high volumes for gas stripping. Um, this will be completed offshore. Uh, additional sampling of pore waters on top of our usual IDP pore water samples. And as Brandon has already mentioned, the possible deployment of uh, these uh, longer term systems. Uh, this is dependent on, on grant approval, I guess. So I think Brandon could probably discuss that in more detail with you if you're interested. And I will now come on to, come on. there we go. Oh, ah, dear me. Apologies for this. There we go, right. Okay, so because we can't do everything we want to do offshore, we need to have what we call the Onshore Science Party, or OSP. This is held at the IDP uh, Bremen Core Repository at the Marum in northern Germany, and it normally lasts up to but no more than four weeks. And this is where the cores are split for the first time, the bulk of the core description and the analysis is completed. Um, the Marum has excellent labs and facilities to analyze the cores and all members of the science party must attend the OSP. It's hard work, it can be a huge amount of fun. There we go. Um, this is a typical list of analyses carried out at the OSP. Again, I won't read them out, I'll let you read them for yourselves. Um, the results of these are published in the expedition report, which goes online one year after the end of the OSP. And during that year, the science party have exclusive access to all of the expedition data. And of course, at the OSP, you have the opportunity to sample for your own personal post-expedition research. So that's it from me. And I will hand back to Dave. Thank you, Jez. Uh, so that concludes the implementation section of the webinar. But um, before we move on to the questions, and there are quite a lot of questions gathering, I just want to talk to you about the application process and what the next steps are. So Jez, if you can go on to the next slide. Hopefully it's... I'm trying. <laughs> it's all right. And, and you can't have a new laptop, don't worry. <laughs> oh, Dave, I didn't need a new laptop, too. <laughs> you could have Jesse's old one. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. It's really not wanting to play today, is it? Here we go. Good. Thank you, Jess. So, um, 
If you haven't found it already, can you please visit this web address that you see on the screen? Um, this takes you to the main IUDP apply to sale page, and that lists the current open calls within IUDP. Next click, Jez. And on that page, you will find a link to the various program member offices of IDP. So these program member offices, or PMOs as we call them, they coordinate the application process for scientists. And scientists should therefore apply through the relevant program member office. So as well as submitting your application through your relevant PMO, I would also urge you um, at the same time to ask them or check their websites for information on participation support for the expedition. So the various PMOs, they do offer widely varying levels of support to participate. Uh, the expedition will obviously pay for your accommodation and your subsistence while you're offshore and also while you're attending the onshore science party in Bremen, um, but all other costs must be paid through your local PMO um, or from other sources. So these other costs are things like travel to and from the ship or the onshore science party, post-expedition grants to help work on samples and travel to post-expedition meetings. And in some cases, some of them do offer uh, salary compensation as well. So in a lot of cases, the PMO pays for these costs, but in other cases, the PMO support can be quite limited. And therefore, the applicant really should find, you know, may need to find support from somewhere else, more li most likely from an external grant or from your institute. So it's really important that you try to get that information from your PMO as early as possible so you can manage your participation. Okay, next slide, Jez. <clears throat> so what are the next steps? Uh, next click, Jez. The application deadline is the 15th of August. Next one, Jez. The PMOs will assess the applications that they receive and the shortlist will then be passed to us, ESO, by the 9th of October. Next slide, here we go. Uh, then ESO and the coaches will get together and we'll review the shortlisted applications and that will happen from mid-October onwards. Um, I will probably meet at the end of October with a view to selecting the science party. And we do that based on expertise required, but also nationality as well. And typically we'll have 12 scientists from ECOR nations, eight from the USA, four from Japan, and then we'll have one each from China, India, and either Australia or New Zealand. Uh, so that's another three. And then we do have some berths reserved for any countries that make an in-kind contribution. So, so far, I don't think that's applicable to this expedition, but it's always an option that we keep open virtually right up to sailing date. Next one, Jess. So expect to, invite to um, issue the invites in November and December, and that should say 2023, obviously. So that'll be at the end of this year. Um, the invites will be for offshore and onshore participation or onshore only participation. So at this stage, we will send you an invitation pack which contains extended information about the expedition, uh, everything from safety training and medicals through to how to submit a sample request and how to request bringing any third party equipment on board. Next one, Jez. So all scientists who accept invitations and participate in the expedition have the same rights and obligations. So they are basically, you will, you will get one year exclusive core and data access, and your main obligation is to publish your personal research in a peer reviewed journal within 20 months. Last, last click. And please, I encourage you to visit the IDP sample data and obligations policy at the link at the bottom of the page. Next one, Jez. Good, so that was all I wanted to add just now. Um, I hope you found that useful and it's given you an idea of what this expedition will entail. Um, so we'll now move on to um, questions. And I see we've, there's many questions that have already been answered. Um, so I'll not go to them just now. And we'll just tackle some of the open questions. And I think many of these are a mixture of science and logistics. Um, so let's just go through them um, one at a time. So first one here, Will biostratigraphers be offshore and assessing ages as drilling is occurring or onshore? I'm assuming onshore. So yes, we will have people, uh, biostratigraphers um, offshore who can look at core catcher samples. Uh, so we don't split the cores at sea, obviously. So we will um, uh, offer core catcher samples for biostratigraphers to look at and they can produce you know, rough estimates of ages 
while we're, dr while we're drilling at sea. For these longer expeditions, uh, we have in the past managed to take samples off the ship and take into a science party member's lab to do further age uh, analysis before the onshore science party. And that's something we can talk to the co-chiefs about to see if that's something that would be worthwhile doing. Um, so it may be that, that we could count on some science party members to do that work while the, while the offshore phase is going and also shortly after that as well to try and pro produce a better age model ahead of the onshore science party. Now, uh, Rolf, ICDP developed methods to reconstruct resonance times and the recharge conditions from transient gas concentrations in the pore water of sediments. However, these methods need access to fresh undisturbed sediments which need to be processed upon core recovery on board. How can this be realized if only single cores are available? Fresh undisturbed sediments will need to be processed. Okay, so I think we need to probably need to discuss this in more depth, um, Rolf. Um, I mean, we're not we're not processing the, the sections at sea. Um, Brandon, your hand's just gone up. Maybe you want to jump in first before I. Yeah. So, so thank you for this question, Rolf. And I I view this. I'm much more of a physical person, um, but we take standard geotechnical samples that are taken in an undisturbed form and sealed offshore, and then sent to people. So it's part of the sample request. Yeah. And I think we could do something like this on a set number of samples, but. Um, as Jez and, and Dave have mentioned, this is all part of the application process and weighing the amount of core availability we have and the sample request, but it is something that I think we could do um, with follow-up discussions. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, what does the geochemistry lab include? Is it equipped with analytical instruments as in the JR? So the, gen, the geochemistry lab is a, it's a 20 foot container. So it's, it's small, of course, and it does, contains some analytical equipment uh, for some um, ephemeral measurements of, 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 of pore water samples, but it's not as extensive as on the JR. Um, so we do have a, there is, we do have a website and uh, we can include these links when we send out the link to the recording to this um, um, webinar that describes exactly the layout of the container and, and what equipment is in, in there. But it's important to understand that the amount of equipment is, is not as much as on the JR. We really do the minimum that we can do offshore. The rule of thumb is if it can be postponed to later onshore, then that's what we'll do. So there is a, a, a pore water preservation and splitting program that happens on the ship. And then any, any analysis that can be done onshore in Bremen is, is postponed to later on. But we will provide uh, that detailed information to you um, through, through the link. Would uh, Mark Person would using the geotech vessel reduce the number of wells drilled? Uh, no, we don't think so. Um, so the the drilling strategy will not change uh, if we, no matter what vessel we use. What will change with the vessels are, is potentially the costs. Um, so because one of the sites is in slightly deeper water, I think it's seventy nine meters, we would need a lift boat that is slightly larger than the ones we've used previously. So the lift boat you see behind me in my background that was in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and that lift boat, I think, could only go up to 54 metres water depth. Um, so to, to tackle that deeper site, we need a larger lift boat, which could be a more expensive facility to hire in, in which case maybe the geotechnical vessel would become the better option. But it would not change the, the, the drilling approach. We would still go for the three sites. Um, it would just be a matter of, of expedition budget. Um, but when we, when we go out to the market to source a vessel, we will not be prescriptive on what, what vessel to use. Clearly using a lift boat, it's, got, it's a stable platform. So there's advantages for coring, there's advantages for downhole logging and also the downhole groundwater work that we're hoping to do because they, we don't rely on any heave compensation. So there are advantage, advantages of using a, a lift boat. And I think we would prefer to use one, but it might be at the end of the day that it's out with our budget, in which case perhaps the geotechnical vessel is, is what we'd use. What, uh, Rolf, again, what about on-site gas, analysis, gas analysis during drilling? Recent developments allow krypton and argon analysis on 20 litres of water, so quite a bit less than the 2,000 litres that we mentioned in our talk. For groundwater, there, there are methods available for allowing gas analysis, and there's a list there on-site, in situ, and in a continuous manner. Um, I don't know, Brian, Brian, oh, there's a couple of comments come after that. Yes. Brandon, do you want to have a 
comment on that. I mean, we would before maybe you do. I would just mention that we you know we haven't we haven't decided yet on the exact procedure for doing the the, the the water analysis on board. If we can do more homework and educate ourselves on some of these more novel and newer techniques for you know doing analysis in smaller volumes of water, then certainly we will we will look at those. Um, you know, we have to specify for the market. You know what we want to do in terms of pumping groundwater volumes. Um, so we need to understand that before we before we go out to tender. But uh, you know we're not done with that part of our homework or our scoping. Um, so it could be that we uh, you know we use some of these um, uh, developments um, offshore. Yes, yeah, so I'll just um, add that, Dave. So yeah, so we're we're still operating as Boris said on this two thousand liters of water, which is based on our earlier versions of the proposal. Um, we are educating ourselves on different ways to to strip and analyze water offshore, what the costs would be, what the infrastructure structure required to be for that. Um, and so I'm sh I will be reaching out to many of you to, to get more information about this as we move on. Um, but it's good to see what kind of work can be done on on smaller volumes of water um, because it will make our lives easier if we don't have to process huge volumes of water as I see Jez smiling and thinking about space on these vessels. So um, definitely I'll be reaching out to many of you for, for more insights and also potential opportunities for collaboration if you have equipment that um, we can include as part of the expedition or not. Thanks, Brandon. Um, if hole 5B still shows fresh and groundwater, do we stop drilling anyway? Uh, so I guess what you're asking here is that if we get to the base of the hole and we're still in fresh and, fresh and groundwater, do we stop and start the next hole? I think the answer to that would be yes, for various reasons. One is we have to, adhere to the depth permitted. Um, so, you know, we can't go beyond the depth that we've been approved to. Um, also, if you do go deeper at any of these sites, it means that you have to go shallower in, in, in another site. So, you know, if you want to get the, you know, if you want to sample all these sites to 550 each, then you can't really um, spend much more time at one of the sites going deeper. Would you, would you agree with that, Brandon? Yeah, I would agree with that. The uh, other thing I would add is on the permitting side, there's sort of two levels of, of permitting and approvals. Um, there's the IODP side where we go through our environmental assessment and our safety assessment um, through IODP, which, which gives these depths, but also there's a whole international permitting side that, that Dave's team is, is leading and getting US permits. And once we get permitted for drill sites, that's where we go. Um, we don't have any flexibility about that, um, um, which is another reason why we will uh, request permitting for all four sites with the intent of only going to three of them. Um, we want to make sure that we have everything permitted that might happen offshore. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, uh, question from Benjamin. Just to clarify, there are no downhole pressure measurements currently funded, but there is the potential for funding coming in, question mark. So downhole pressure measurements, uh, what are we talking about here? So uh, it's just, forgive me, this is maybe you know, beyond my expertise here. Are we talking pump tests here or you know, water pressure? My guess is this is, this is down in situ water pressure measurements. Um, that is a, 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 a tricky activity at, at best in, in offshore drilling um, in the limited time we have. It's difficult to do a shut-in test like industry would do or anything like that and wait for equilibration. So there's no plan to do anything like a penetrometer type pressure measurement or bring in Schlumberger's uh, MDT tool, which can go into the formation and maybe get um, in situ pressures. But there is an opportunity um, funding waiting to hear back from NSF on putting a long-term pressure measuring system. Um, so we, but my plan would be to interpret the pore pressure um, from the drilling samples, like many of us have done in IODP before, and then get long-term pressure measurements with an observatory, but there'd be no, no real-time direct measurements of pressure in situ. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Rolf, what about scientists from Europe? So yes, yeah, scientists from Europe can participate. Um, they fall under the ECORD umbrella. So ECORD is the European Consortium for Ocean Research Drilling. It's a consortium of 14 European countries plus Canada. So 15 countries in total, uh, and they can send their scientists on to exp IDP expeditions. There is a kind of sub quota system within ECORD. So different ECORD members put in different amounts of money and they get different amounts of berths back. Uh, so for instance, Germany, France and UK are the biggest funders of ECORD. So they get two berths each 
on expeditions and then they have other countries putting in a lesser amount and they get births less frequently on IDP expeditions. So um, I, I'm not going to recall the full list of 14 countries off the top of my head. Um, I'll probably miss one or two if I try to do that. But yes, European scientists are absolutely welcome to apply to sail and be, you know, the, the ECOR does um, feature quite prominently in all IDP expeditions in terms of their um, presence off, off, on board. Brandon, do you want to add something? I just had a, a follow-up question about this. I, I know most of the um, PMOs have posted the applications, but there's not an application process posted for India or China yet. Do you have any idea about if that is being posted or when they'll be posted from IODP China or IODP India? Uh, no, I don't have information on that. All the PMOs know that we have, so I've written to all the PMOs to open this call. It may be they're just taking some time to translate that call onto their own systems. I mean, if it's not there now, I'd expect it to appear pretty soon. Um, right. I, I can chase them up, but usually they, they, they do get around to it at, 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 at their own. I'll keep an eye on through, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Next question. What is an in-kind contribution? So an in-kind contribution so the way these expeditions are funded, it's the, the, the members of ECORD put money into a pot and it's that money that's then used to, to fund these expeditions. It is possible for a country or an institute to provide a non-cash contribution in order to join the expedition. So it has to be something like a service or a facility that contributes to the expedition that we would otherwise pay for. So for example, if we're doing a long expedition offshore New England, and we might need to have a service boat come out or we might have to transfer samples to and from the vessel. If that supply boat could be you know, provided by a local institute or a, or a local country, then that has a cash value. It has a, you know, a monetary value to ECORD and it reduces the cost to them. And then that can be rewarded with perhaps an extra science party berth for that country or institute making the contribution. So it's a way of for ECORD to encourage, you know, ways to reduce the cost of expeditions in reward for extra science party positions to whoever is making that contribution. And it's called an in-kind contribution because it's not necessarily cash. It can sometimes be some other facility that we require. So if you have an idea of a potential in-kind contribution that could be made here, please just get in touch with me and describe what you have in mind. Um, and we can start that discussion with eCord to see if it's feasible and workable and whether there could be a birth reward for that. So we have three three births in reserve for exactly that kind of thing. And we have used that in the past for various expeditions. So I hope that answers uh, your question there. Just out of interest, this is from Jacob. Is it possible for early career researchers to apply for the offshore phase? The answer is absolutely, for sure. Um, we want people of all different career stages to apply. We like to have our science parties cover a spread from senior researchers to early career to PhD students. And there are many factors come into play when choosing a science party. I mean, number one, it's always expertise. We have nationality, we have gender, and we have career stage as well. And we try to mix all these things to have a nice diverse um, science party. So yes, absolutely. If you're a PhD student, please apply to SAIL. And um, you will not be um, you, you will not be a disadvantage just because you're doing your PhD. Quite the reverse, in fact. Do that. Um, Adrian's asking the proposal six three seven is only uploaded as the two page summary. Could the full summary be uploaded to the expedition web page? Uh, this is a question for you, Brandon. Some some proponents allow this and some don't. Um, it, it's up to you whether you are happy for the full proposal to be made public or not you don't maybe maybe you don't want to answer it now we can discuss it offline but i'm happy to answer it right now and yeah. i'll just provide the caveats um so for those um who don't know the original proposal was submitted in 2004 20 years uh from submission to drilling i'm not trying to scare anybody away i'm just giving you the reality of it um so there have been about eight or nine versions or uh iterations of the proposal some of which are full proposals some of which are are addendum so it's a really sort of convoluted mess. I'm happy to, to share them all. And, and um, there's nothing in there that's proprietary. So we can try to figure out the best way to put them together and make sure that the, the pertinent information is out there. We will also be um, publishing sometime soon the prospectus, which will sort of distill down all of those proposals into the, the, the fundamental science, the integration of all those proposals, um, 
and what our operational plan is. So those will be coming out. Um, Adrian or anyone else can contact me directly and I'm happy to send you things ahead of time. There's also a plan um, to write a short piece for scientific drilling in, um, in the fall about this as well. So um, we can pull things together in, in, in real time, but it'll be kind of messy. Um, and if you can wait a little bit longer, you might get something that's a little easier to digest. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, next one, how many sedimentologists would you expect are needed for the onshore party? Um, so uh, this depends on the expertise of the sedimentologists that apply, uh, but generally, we, you know, it could be a number between four and eight, um, and it really depends on, you know, what the, the co-chiefs think they need. I mean, Brandon, just now, do you have a, and Karen, do you have an idea of how many sedimentologists you think you might need? Um, my, my, answer to this question was probably about six, which is perfect with your four to eight range. It's, it's um, and, and again, it depends a little bit on expertise, um, also sort of cross-disciplinary scientists. So sometimes somebody might be a sedimentologist and also um, a physical properties person, like in terms of their research. So we wanna make sure that we cover all the expedition objectives, but also people's personal research. But I, I, would, I would say six is probably a good estimate based on how much core we anticipate getting and the, and the goals that we have. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, question here, are the locations of the holes fixed? Can we do 8A and 4C first, then decide where should be the third and the fourth holes? So I think maybe this was in the presentations, but well, the, the, the locations are fixed, so the four sites are fixed, and we can't change them at this time. Um, but we're aiming to do three of the four. So yes, we can do two first, and then at C, choose which one of the remaining two we want to do. And I think, is that correct, Brandon? It's, eight, it's 8A and 4C first, and then the third hole we will decide Yep, 8A to make sure we hit the, the freshwater tongue 4C because it could be the transition. And, and based on what we see in sort of the real time um, pore water analysis is where we'll make the decision to go to 3C or 5B next. So exactly uh, as Jimmy asked, um, that, that's our goal is to sort of make a real time decision on what that, that third, third site will be. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Alan is asking, for, for, those, for those of us interested in collecting water samples, should we submit a full application to sale or just email the co-chief scientists about coordinating sample collection? Um, so <clears throat> the, way, the way it works in IDP is that the science party, um, who, those are the people who are invited to join the expedition, so that's to either sail or come to the onshore science party, they will get priority uh, with their sample requests. So if any science party members, and I'm sure there will be many, will apply for exactly those samples. And of course they would get first refusal on those. Um, so uh, yes, I think you would want to um, submit an application. You would not, not necessarily to sail, uh, it could be just to attend the onshore science party, but as a minimum, it would be attending the onshore science party. There's, it is possible to apply for samples from an expedition and not take part in the expedition. That is a, That option is open all the time, um, but, the priority is always given to those people who actually go to to the expedition. So unless you're proposing something that's particularly novel or very different, that's not covered by the science party, then you might be awarded those samples and not be part of the expedition. But it's quite rare for that to happen, but it is possible. So I don't know, it, may, it will depend on what analysis you're intending to do. Is it something that somebody else is already proposing, somebody in the science party, or is it something completely new and unique? In which case, if it's a latter case, you could possibly get samples. Uh, what is the planned duration for the pump tests? Uh, I don't know actually the answer to that. Brandon, maybe you have a better idea. Yeah, and the original, well, whatever original means, and in one of the versions of the proposal and the discussions, um, you know, based on a, a back of the envelope calculation, we anticipated sort of a 24 hour pump test um, for each test. Um, again, this will be dictated um, in part by um, what options we have for pump tests and packing, um, which is still something we're working through as we learn more about what our vessel will be. Um, and also, you know, a big thing here is these are unconsolidated sediments. We are in the ocean um, and we'll have to make decisions based on hole stability and integrity and things like that. But ideally, um, 24 hours would be amazing. I don't think we, uh, in any, in, in any scenario that we've discussed, would it be longer than 24 hours, but um, probably, and it could be less.
Next one from Douglas. Following Rolf's question, some real-time monitoring of dissolved gases may be possible by headspace sampling for the drilling fluid. Might this be possible? Uh, yes, I think it might be possible. I mean, it will be done for safety reasons anyway. Um, I guess it depends on what exact gases need to be analysed here, but uh, this is something that we could certainly um, look into if it's required. So part of the process we have here is we have our minimum measurements that we will always do uh, for IDP expeditions. When the size party are selected, they are invited to submit sample requests before the expedition. And from those sample requests, we can you know, assess them for any additional requirements that are needed in order to you know, suit those sample, in order to meet those sample requests. So if people have extra um, requirements beyond the minimum, um, we will do our best to provide the, the, the consumables and the facilities to take those extra uh, samples and measurements, um, either at sea or later at the, uh, at the onshore science party. So the, that sample request stage is really critical for translating scientists' needs onto the facilities on the ship that we that, that we have. But yes, it, it, it's certainly something that's, that, that could, could be possible. Next one here, uh, we notice there's a chance to take large volume samples. Are they only from the bottom of the boreholes or at different depths during the drillings? Uh, is it able to conduct large volume water samples for uranium thorium series of measurements we might employ to explore equilibrium states of the sediment fluid interactions and estimate the age of the offshore fresh and groundwater? Say if it is large, larger than the age range of 81 uh, range of oh, Krypton, sorry. Yeah. So um, yes, we it will be at different levels. So specific intervals will be identified and packed off and screened. Um, so it's not just from the bottom of the borehole. Um, so we, but whether we can do this for, I mean, I'm not familiar with uranium thorium series on large volume water samples. Brandon, are you? I'm not, so I um, I agree completely, Dave. Uh, yeah, so we will look at different zones. Um, how we isolate those different zones will um, either be a dual packer system or a single packer as we're drilling down. Again, this is gonna be decided partly with what the vessel um, capability is. Um, I don't know what the vo water volume is for uranium thorium. So uh, Jen, if you wanna reach out to me, I'd be happy to um, continue this discussion and learn more about it. Um, my goal is to collect, you know, like I said during my talk, the best data that we can reasonably um, in the time frame that we have, and, and we don't want to miss something if we have an opportunity to collect it. So um, definitely learn more, and then we have to also, um, you know, make sure that we distribute samples in, in a way that's uh, aligned with the the science priorities of the expedition. But um, understanding the age of the water is a huge priority here. Thank you, Brandon. Last question, how many pumping tests will be done in a hole based, uh, based, is it going to be based on the number of aquifers? So I think, Brandon, you said maximum two. Yeah, two, uh, maybe maybe three, I think we've discussed at some point. A lot of it depends on whether we want to do, you know, if we do three, then we'd have to do less time per pumping test. Um, and um, it won't be really based on the number of aquifers um, because we, we are going to have to sort of make real-time decisions. So it'll sort of be at the, uh, the best two or three locations as we're drilling and making those decisions. Um, that's just the, the reality of, of having 60 to 80 days of operational time and how much things cost um, and making decisions in real time. Good, uh, question from Boris. Will this QA be put on the website and is it possible to continue the QA in the next weeks in some way? So yes, we will put the QA uh, out with the link to this recording for the webinar so people can review it and also people who aren't here can, can see what's going on. Um, and there are a number of um, questions that we haven't talked about. They were answered offline um, through the chat function. Um, so we'll just review those answers and just make sure that we're happy that the correct information has been given. And then yes, we'll, we'll post the transcript out. Um, in terms of continuing the Q&A, this is something we've not generally done, but I do like the idea of keeping the, the channels open. Um, so what we can do is, um, I'll have a think about exactly the, me the, the mechanism for doing that, um, whether we can do it by email or open up some kind of forum somewhere, um, I'll check. But certainly in the, in the first instance, if you have further questions about this expedition, if they're of a scientific nature, please contact 
Brandon and Karen, uh, and if it's of a more kind of logistical operational nature, then myself and Jez are the people to contact. So certainly you'll get answers to your questions from us. Uh, but if you want to have a conversation with the wider community who are also watching this webinar, I'll need to think about how how to actually set that up. We don't currently have that facility available, but I'll I'll get my thinking hat on for that. Uh, will there be the possibility or space for online measurement of the pumped water? So that, I guess you mean real time or semi real time measurements. And um, yes, so we want to, as part of the, 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 the service that we hope to procure with the drilling company, um, they'll obviously be responsible for doing the pump test and we will ask for um, the capability to monitor fluids, fluid, fluid characteristics in semi real time from, from, from the vessel. I think that's Paul. I think that's what's being asked here. Yeah, I think that's what's being asked, and I, I yeah, I think Tom, Tomas, that's uh, exact. We're, we're we're hoping to have space to do that. There's actually some good trade-offs if we can monitor some things in real time. It saves shipping samples around, and it makes us, uh, it allows us to make better real-time decisions. Um, so we're looking into the possibility of that. Um, but as as we've said a couple of times, we will be somewhat controlled by um, what our vessel capabilities are. Um, this also feeds back into some of the other questions about people rotating on and off. Um, yes, there will likely be scientists rotating on and off on some schedule based on, on technical needs. Like, so there's a special real-time sampling expertise we need. We will work with uh, ESO to make sure that those people were out there at the right time. I guess if that's appropriate statement, Dave. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Good. So we've covered the open questions. Um, thank you very much, everyone for joining in today. Apologies that we went through the hour. Karen, I know I'm aware that you do have a, a field trip to, to head off to. So please, if you need to run off, thank you so much for sticking around. I do appreciate it. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. But for everyone else, um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming in today. Again, if you have any further questions about the expedition, then please, Brandon, Karen, myself and Jez are available to answer your questions. We will be sharing this recording sending the link to everyone who registered along with the transcript of the question and answers. Um, so thank you for your time. And we really hope that we've secured your interest and we really hope that you submit a application to, to join the expedition. And we look forward to reviewing those applications later in the year. So please keep that deadline of the 15th of August in mind and uh, please submit an application. Every application is, is very welcome. So thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Karen, for your presentations. Thank you also, Jez, as well. And thank you everyone who attended for all your uh, questions too. It's made for a, a nice discussion. So we'll leave it there. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Evening, Bye, morning. Everybody.